The agenda this week heard why some people are giving up their pandemic pets, examined teenagers' declining eagerness for learning to drive, and checked in on India's democratic woes. The agenda's week in review begins with how tough it can be to run for elected office here in Canada. Access to network, access to money, access to a machine, a lot of people think without that, you can't be successful. Todd, obviously, you had a political party behind you, you had a fundraising apparatus behind you. Uh, you know, you had a leader who was obviously quite concerned that you win, so you had all that going for you. What machine was backing you? I built my machine. Uh, my community was my machine. Uh, my community has shown up for me in incredible ways over the years, encouraged me, you know, in my political aspirations in terms of advocacy and, and organizing. But it's a coalition of, of groups, I presume, yes? Um, yeah, I mean... So who's in that coalition? So I, when I first decided I was going to run, I br brought together about 20 of my closest personal friends, mentors, and, you know, um, colleagues, professional colleagues, to say, I'm thinking about this crazy thing, and what do you all think about this? Would you support me through this endeavor? Um, and they were all very, you know, um, supportive and, and um, enthusiastic about me taking this on. And so just knowing they had my back, it gave me the confidence to go forward, to continue to draw on and mobilize the networks that I had already been building since I was a teenager in my community through doing organizing. I had been um, pulling together all candidates' debates and, you know, mobilizing young people around trying to get a community center and space for ourselves to you know um, be able to do things other than hang out with idle hands uh, you know in the neighborhood um, and so yeah it really was an effort that took quite some time for me to identify um, who I could work with there was a group called women win to that was organized by former counselor current MPP Kristen Wong Tam uh, amongst many others um, including Thelma Morgan who works with Operation Black Vote Canada was one of the founding members and um, they trained a, a group of about 20 young women who had political aspirations in 2017 to understand what it takes to run a winning campaign. So folks like Peggy Nash, other professionals and experts in the field came through and, and helped us understand what it took. I wonder if you had any of that behind you when you ran for mayor. No. <laughs> None of that? You had no. no coalition or machine or something? I'm a policy analyst. I eat policy for breakfast. <laughs> and that was my advantage. Um, I work at... Toronto Metropolitan University right now and I evaluate a variety of federally funded projects that are focused on the future of work. Mm -hmm. So it's like all I really had to do was bring the work table to the platform. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I thought was a lot easier than building a machine behind me because I am the machine. <laughs> <laughs> knowing, so, yeah. you, knowing you a little as I do, uh, I can confirm that. <laughs> you are the machine. Yes, indeed. Okay, ta uh, again, you're a little different in as much as you did have this apparatus behind you, but, but let's approach it from this standpoint. You can't just decide, I'm going to be the candidate for the progressive conservatives in such and such a riding, and therefore it happens. <laughs> you actually have to earn the right to be the PC standard bearer. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Talk to us about networks, money, access to people, organization, all that. Well, I prefer to call all those things relationships, Steve. Okay. Life is about relationships. Politics is about relationships, and governing is about relationships, and it's it's listening more than talking. Uh, now, what I did run for and win a seat on the school board in 1994 in Durham, um, and so I definitely can relate to uh, Chloe and Amber about that endeavor because, of course, you're not affiliated with a party, mm -hmm. so you do you do have to put together your own team. Then, when you run provincially or federally, as I have. Of course, you're part of a team with the leader as, as leading that team and leading the message. And your job is, as Jim Flaherty taught me, to be part of that team because politics is a team sport at the provincial and federal level. Did you run and, federally as well? And I, I did I did run federally in 2019. Run? Yes. So, so you lost that a, one too. Yeah, okay. So but Steve, <laughs> I, I, forgot that. I, I as I said on election night when I won on June second, I'm batting four hundred, which mm. isn't bad in baseball. So five elections, two wins, that's batting four hundred. <laughs> I think in this province we largely treat people's <clears throat> companion animals as their own problem and we don't provide enough social support through public funding and other you know public provincial mechanisms to support people in keeping their animals with them um, I don't think you generally see people who want to give up animals and who feel good about that decision I suspect a lot of abandonment has to do not only with inability to find a place for those animals to go but also the social shame of feeling like a failure and being unable to keep that animal with you in your own home 
Um, but you know, what we see in this province, Steve, is, uh, and across the country, is largely governments treating these sheltering type issues as a private problem that charities should address. Instead of providing you know, public infrastructure and really strong supports to make sure that you know, shelters have the capacity, that rescues have the capacity to um, deal with this question and this issue when people can't care for animals any longer. So what does that look like? If you, you know, in, in, in your best world, what does a more community-based approach look like? Yeah, you know, I think we do some public funding of some shelter operations, especially when you look at um, larger cities like Toronto. Um, Toronto Animal Services receives funding for operating shelters. But most shelter and rescue operations are run on donations. They're run on volunteer power. They're run um, because people, out of the goodness of their hearts, believe it's the right thing to do for care, to care for animals. Uh, and that, of course, is the case. But there's also a lot of social and public benefits that accrue from making sure that we have this public infrastructure to take in cats, dogs, rabbits, reptiles, other animals who need homes. Reptiles? Reptiles. Like what? You know, lizards, um, snakes, iguanas. These are all animals that are, unfortunately, are still legal to keep and possess and own in, in you know, most places in the country. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's often a very challenging animal to care for. People don't typically understand or always understand the needs that those animals have. And sometimes that can lead them to want to give them up and uh, abandon them, sadly. Kathy, can you help me on that one? People have pep reptiles where you are, snakes, lizards, that kind of thing? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I agree with um, Camilla 100%. We advocate you know, that pets should be included in the social safety net. And so when we're looking at supporting families, we should be looking at supporting all members of the families, including including the companion animals. And that would ex extend to providing funding to organizations that are supporting the animals. Because of the work that Pause for Hope does, we, you know, we're often working with the same families that our colleagues in social services are supporting. We're just supporting their their companion animals and they're supporting the humans. But really, we need a system that is looking at animal welfare, not only as a social service, but as a social justice issue. Um, because what we are seeing is families that are struggling are disproportionately marginalized mm -hmm. and don't have access to human services in the same way that they are struggling with access to animal services. In which case, Phil, what do you need? <laughs> there, there's a lot that's needed on that, I think, and, and we're lucky at this point that the Vet Act in Ontario is up for review. Um, and revision because the the entire model of how veterinary care and access to care is delivered in the province needs an overhaul. It's it's an antiquated and dated system, and it's preventing um, right now solutions that could make care more accessible to individuals and pets and families from from existing. Um, the last major review happened in the late '80s, and it, it's time to not only be caught up but also to be forward looking and you know evaluate the models that can make care accessible. We focus a lot on. Um, sheltering and reactionary programs which are necessary because the preventative programming and the preventative services aren't there to support people before they hit their breaking point and before those animals um, end up without anywhere else to go. I, I'm sure m most people watching this don't understand the nuances of what you're trying to advance here right now, but is it a question of what? More storage, more care, more what? I think it's more capacity within the industry. Um, care providers within the veterinary industry across the country, are there's, there's a national shortage. Right. There's not enough veterinarians, there's not enough veterinary technicians and other uh, paraprofessionals to deliver the services to the volume of animals that exist. Kylie, when you got your driver's license, how old were you? I was 19. You were 19? You waited three years. How come? I started with a few lessons from a um, private teacher and I felt that I hadn't quite learned enough to confidently drive out in the road, so I did another round of lessons. Gotcha. Teresa, how old were you? I was 16. I got my license on my 16th birthday. On the day. Yeah, absolutely. As, as one did back then. Of course. Not that it was so long ago, but that's what I did too. <laughs> Sean, how about you? 16th birthday, I was there getting my 365 that I had my full G shortly thereafter. 365, that's what we used to call it back Absolutely. in the day. What did that mean anyway? It was valid for a year. It was the equivalent of a G1 and allowed you to drive with a supervising driver. Got it. Okay, pick up the story. Why does there seem to be this delay, this this situation where no longer, you know, 16-year-olds are out there on their birthday grabbing their driver's license as soon as they possibly can? 
Uh, I have to speculate. Uh, my, my wife doesn't drive. She doesn't have her license. I tried to get her to uh, to take her uh, the program, but it didn't work out. Uh, <laughs> she never needed it. She lived on a on a transit line. Uh, everything was so accessible, and across the street from where she lived was the, the grocery store. It was, just wasn't a need. And why spend the money on something that you're not going to use? Hmm. Teresa. What do you think's going on? I think there's a number of things, right? Social media or, or mobile phones have replaced the need to see each other in person. You know, my 15-year-old son can uh, play games and connect with his friends all through a microphone and headset and not have to be in the same room to socialize, I think is one aspect. Cost is another. It's, it's mm -hmm. expensive. And parents are driving their kids longer. Kylie, you told us about your own personal circumstances, but look society-wide now. Why do you, what would you add to the list of reasons why kids are not out there getting their driver's license as soon as they turn 16? Well, at least in BC, we have to go through um, an L learner's permit, and then an N, and then a full license. So a full license I got when I was 19, and getting your L you can get when you're 16 in BC. Um, these tests uh, cost money, and a lot of young people in this generation are struggling with money and everything is just costing so much they simply cannot afford to get a vehicle or afford the insurance or even afford to take the test to get your license let me follow up with uh, uh, okay admittedly a bit of a tricky question here you were in an accident once upon a time yes yes tell us about that yes i was in an accident in 2011 I was eight years old at the time, and uh, I still struggle from the aftermath of that crash. I have a chronic neck and back pain that will stick with me for the rest of my life. And along with that came a concussion at the time, uh, whiplash, and I now deal with uh, PTSD. So. My goodness, I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that, but would you say that's part of the explanation why you were not so gung-ho to get out there and get your license right away? Yeah, it was uh, it was scary, I guess, because uh, when you're that young, you feel completely safe around adults. The adult is driving, they know what they're doing, you have your complete trust in them, and to have that broken is hard to get over, and especially when it's now your turn to be the adult that need to have control over the situation and you are now responsible for the other people in the vehicle. It's a lot of responsibility and it's a little scary. Given what you've just heard, what do we conclude about whether Prime Minister Modi is in fact governing in the way that one would expect the leader of a democracy to govern in? What do you say? Well, I would have to say, Steve, that we need to take a uh, a long view of this, of democracy in India, and it's not that you know, the story starts with Mr. Modi. Go back to 1947, many people believed India wouldn't survive as a democracy. Churchill famously thought India would collapse and implode and couldn't govern itself. And yet India has had election after election, every election bigger than the last, everyone is a, everyone is, uh, you know, a feast of democracy. So clearly India has gotten that right elections right now what happens in between elections that's a different matter um i would say on this notion of electoral autocracy th there's a bigger point here steve which is that our westminster system unfortunately for good or ill uh, is prone to majorities in parliament uh essentially being able to do what they want within the limits of a constitution a supreme court oversight and, and so forth so so this problem of a strong majority in parliament, meaning you can pretty much do what you want, is not unique to India. Uh, you know, we've seen it in Canada, we've seen it in the UK. Uh, so I, I, I take somewhat exception to the to the notion that this is sort of a, a problem unique to India or, or to Mr. Modi. All right, I got to get the guy with the democracy forum to come in on that. What do you conclude about the way Modi is governing? Is it consistent with how one would expect a democratic leader to govern? Well, I think you know Vivek is absolutely right that we should look at one side of the ledger, which is the elections. In the 2019 and 2014 election before that, more people voted in India than ever before, roughly 66% of the electorate. For the first time, you had parity of men and women voting. Uh, there was even a higher turnout amongst those who belonged to, Dal to the Dalits and Adivasi communities in India. So there's a great deal of vibrancy in the electoral space. But on the other hand, what we've seen in India, and I think it's true, we should put it in comparative context, 
We've seen across the world democratic backsliding, uh, south of the border, of course, Brazil, Hungary, mm -hmm. Turkey. Um, in Britain, we've seen the rise of the far right in many countries. So what we're seeing is increasing majoritarianism in our politics, a more resurgent nationalism, a more exclusionary understanding of who's a citizen. And that has happened in India. Um, and I think, I think we could have a, a, you know, dis, uh, a debate about this or a discussion about this. I do think what's happened in India has been quite striking. There's been a real concentration of power in the hands of the prime minister's office. Uh, the cabinet and parliament um, are much weaker than they used to be. India had coalition governments for 25 years. There was a lot more power sharing. Um, and so I do think that something has happened in India which is quite striking. It's not unique to India, but because it's the world's largest democracy, because it is an emerging power, it, it matters more in the world. And I think that's why a lot of people have drawn attention to it. Shaker, I should get you on the same question. What do you think? Well, uh, yes, uh, there is a trend. There's a worldwide trend. If you, if you, if you look at the state of the world, you can go uh, clockwise or anti-clockwise. I used to say it more emphatically until a couple of years back. And I said, look, go either any which way you will see. Uh, if you go clockwise, you see uh, Trump. Then you see Putin, uh, Xi Jinping, Shinzo Abe, uh, Narendra Modi, uh, Erdogan, uh, Netanyahu, and uh, and Orban, and Bolsonaro. And when you got bored, there was always Duterte. Right now, some of those have gone. Uh, Trump has gone. A uh, couple of the others, Netanyahu has gone and come back. Uh, but generally, the trend right now is that in elected democracies, uh, where genuine genuine elections take place, I'm not talking about say in this case uh, about China or uh, Russia, them included though. Uh, there is a trend that strong men of the nationalist right are taking power and people seem to like them. That's just some of what we covered this week. You can find more, including the full conversations, on our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.